Okay, let's talk. For as long as I can remember, movie and TV adaptations of stories that were initially told in another medium have been heavily criticized. It's just kind of always been that way. Fans of the source material are rarely happy with the way an adaptation turns out, and most of the time, that disappointment is justified. And to be fair, it is quite a difficult endeavor to adapt a story faithfully in a completely different medium. More people have failed than succeeded. Usually, failed adaptations are disasters for a few reasons. Either they try to make changes that don't really make any sense and suck the soul out of what made that story special, or on the contrary, they try to be a little too faithful to the source material even if it doesn't fit the medium they're trying to adapt it in. But usually, people are gonna look at the differences. Fans tend to be very upset when an adaptation of something they love shows differences in their stories, and sometimes that's justified, but sometimes not at all. Because let's be completely honest, sometimes when adapting something, changes to the source material is necessary, but it can also be a good thing. A lot of writers and filmmakers have adapted stories by carefully and intelligently making modifications to improve them. They can be big, major changes with plot points or characters, and sometimes they're just small little tweaks that don't seem like much but do make a huge difference. I have always been of the opinion that a movie or TV show not being a faithful adaptation of its source material doesn't necessarily make it bad. Sometimes it does, yes. Sometimes adaptations try to do their own thing or to change elements from the source material in ways that just don't work and essentially kill all of the appeal of the original story, like the Percy Jackson movies, The Girl on the Train, The Dark Tower, Paper Towns, A Wrinkle in Time, The Hobbit, or more recently with the ever-growing frustration from pretty much everyone, The Witcher. And when it comes to that scenario, I have to say, my 12-year-old self will never fully recover from how bad the Aragon movie was. That was an insanely unpleasant experience. I was such a fan of the books, it's been so long now I barely remember them. But it's been almost 20 years and I still can't believe this movie turned out this bad. There is also the absolute plague that is the track record of video game adaptations. It's gotten better over the years, and there have been some gems here and there in the past. Like, I think people tend to forget that Pokemon is a video game adaptation, and that literally shattered pop culture. But you just have to admit that the good ones are very few and far between, especially given the amount of video game adaptations coming out all the time. So many of them just broke my brain when I watched them, because I just could not understand how they could get it so wrong. The Silent Hill movies, Prince of Persia, Assassin's Creed, the abysmal Tekken movie from 2009, which I believe is one of the few movies that are still sitting at a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes, Max Payne, House of the Dead, Hitman, literally every single Resident Evil movie and show that came out in the last 20 plus years. Like, it's a bloodbath. For every rare good video game adaptation, there's like 10 or 15 other ones that are just atrocious. So yeah, long story short, bad adaptations are kind of frequent, but there are some exceptions. It's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. Like, guys. This is literally my Roman Empire. For the past few months, I've been wanting to explore adaptations that achieve the impossible task of surpassing the source material. Now, I'm sure when I say that, most people will have at least one title coming to mind. One that often comes back is Fight Club, and more recently, House of the Dragon, and I think they're both right. There's also a panoply of movies that most people don't even know were based on novels, like Mean Girls, American Psycho, Jurassic Park, or even Jaws. And that is not a coincidence. The books may have been good, I don't know, I haven't read them, but they clearly were not that memorable. The adaptations, however, were. So much so that the source material kind of fell into oblivion. And today, I want to talk about that. There are adaptations out there that have truly marked me and made me obsessed with this notion of taking an existing story and fully unlocking its potential to make it something better than it was ever meant to be. Adaptations that outdid the execution of one same idea. And let me be super clear, I feel like I need to clarify, we are not talking about 
good adaptations here. There are plenty of good adaptations. It doesn't necessarily mean they're better than the source material. Here, we are specifically going to focus on adaptations that surpassed the source material, and more specifically, why they surpass the source material. And you will see that there is a very common theme that kind of comes back for almost all of them. We're gonna get into it, but first, let's take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor, Scentbird. Okay, so here's the thing. I'm kind of a newbie when it comes to fragrances. I'm just starting to get into it and I keep running into a problem. Have you ever bought a full-size bottle of perfume thinking it was a home run, but then after a couple uses, you realize you don't actually like that scent anymore? Yeah, well, that happens to me all the time because I have no skill whatsoever. So I needed a guy to help me find my signature scent. And that is when Scentbird came in and said, Broski. We got you. They sent me three fragrances picked from their incredible catalog for me to try, and let's just say they did not hold back. For the uninitiated, Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service that allows you to try new designer fragrances each month for just $17. With each fragrance you pick, they will send you a 30-day supply to try new fragrances before deciding if you want to buy the full-sized bottle. They have an insane amount of choices, so really, the world is your oyster here. Try anything. The first fragrance they sent me is called Cross Gorilla River, which sounds like the title of a Lady Gaga album that never came out. And I really liked it. It's smooth, it's fresh, it's giving some forest vibes with a hint of green apple. Crazy good. Loved it. Next, I got another one called Incense Water, which also sounds like a Lady Gaga album, I'm not gonna lie. And this one is also an absolute win. Any scent that has a hint of citrus immediately gets me, and this was no exception. And lastly, we got Arabesque. A super soft and inviting fragrance with a beautiful scent of flowers and fruits, and it just makes you want to run barefoot in a field for no reason. God damn it, three for three, I don't know which one to choose, I like them all. And again, their selection is so vast and versatile, no matter what type of person you are, there is something for everyone there. So, if you also want to step your perfume game up and smell like heaven, make sure to click the link in the description below to visit Sandbird's website or scan the QR code currently on screen and use my code Space Ninja for 55% off your first month at Scentbird. That's only about $8 for your first month. That's kind of crazy. So take the opportunity to level up, broski. This is your chance. Go to Scentbird's website and use my code Space Ninja for 55% off your first month at Scentbird. You won't regret it. Thank you so much to Scentbird for sponsoring this video. You guys are the best. And let's get back to the video. All right, with that out of the way, let's dive into our adaptations. I picked nine of them because they're the ones that have been in my head the most, and also because they fall under that category for different reasons and for the different ways they were changed in the process of being adapted. We're gonna get through a number of different genres, and oh, careful for spoilers with every single entry on this list. So without further ado, here are nine adaptations that surpassed their source material. Starting with number nine. Kingsman. Yeah, this is a great place to start. I feel like Kingsman is one of those examples where a large majority of people had never heard about the source material until the movie came out. It's an adaptation of a comic book that came out in 2012 and was written by the legendary Mark Miller, known for making iconic and super influential comics like Superman Red Sun, The Authority, Kick-Ass, Old Man Logan, and Marvel's Civil War. I remember reading a little bit of the Kingsman comics years ago, although at the time they weren't called Kingsman, the IP was simply known as the Secret Service, and I thought it was fine. I didn't think the comic was anything that crazy, so when a movie adaptation was announced, I kinda didn't care. Like, I'd stopped reading the comics very early on because I wasn't that interested, so I had absolutely no excitement for the upcoming big screen take on the franchise. And then, the movie actually came out, and like literally everyone else, I got slapped in the face with how bonkers and fun this movie was. The way it takes the concept of this story and makes it this 
this unique, hyper-stylized, visually gorgeous blast of fun was such a surprise. And it makes some significant changes from the source material. Eggsy is a much cooler character in the movie than he is in the comics. He's way more fun and charismatic. Also, in the comics, Harry is named Jack London, and he is Eggsy's uncle. The movie completely ignores that. Harry is literally just a guy. But as an original character, he just works. And Colin Firth and Taron Egerton have such impeccable chemistry that their bond feels much more well executed than the one in the comics. The movie also changes the villains in the story quite a lot, offering a way more unique entity with Sam Jackson's Valentine. Another big modification that makes the story so much more fun than the original. Like really, the film just takes liberties very smartly and it works every single time. Even some of the most iconic moments in the movie are not adapted from the comic book. The legendary church sequence that nobody has been able to stop talking about since the movie came out is unique to the movie. It is not in the comics, this is an original idea. Sophia Batella's character is turned into a silent assassin with crazy battle skills and overall, the story just flows much better and is way more engaging. Oh, and let me just clarify, um, I'm only talking about the first movie here. I personally was not a fan of the sequel, The Golden Circle, and I never saw the King King's Man, the prequel that came out a couple years ago, but as far as the first movie goes, yeah, this is far better than the comics. This movie just took the potential of the average at best source material it was adapting and just cranked it up to 11 to make a truly memorable film. Number 8. The Queen's Gambit. So, fun fact, I recently found out through a friend that a lot of people who have seen The Queen's Gambit on Netflix think the show is a biopic. Like, they fully believe it is a true story, and a lot of people still think that Beth Harmon is a real person that existed. So, for anyone watching this video who doesn't know yet, um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna burst your bubble. The Queen's Gambit is actually an adaptation of a novel of the same name written by Walter Tevis that came out in 1983. A number of people in Hollywood tried to adapt the book at several points in time, but it failed every single time, more often than not because of a tragedy. The first time happened right after the novel came out, but the project was cancelled because Tevis passed away in 1984, about a year after the release of the book. There was even a movie adaptation being worked on in 2007 that was going to be directed by Heath Ledger. It was going to be his directorial debut and he had attached Elliot Page to play the role of Beth Harmon. But the project was cancelled less than a year later because Heath Ledger died. So yeah, needless to say, the arrival of the Netflix series was the end of a very, very long road for this adaptation. Scott Frank, the writer of Logan, one of the greatest comic book movies of all time, was the one who finally brought it to life, with Anya Taylor-Joy cast in the role of Beth. A few months after the series came out and just took over the world, I decided to read the Queen's Gambit novel, and yes, there are a lot of small but subtle improvements in the series. While the novel isn't bad by any means, it's actually pretty good, I find that the show makes the story and the character of Beth Harmon way more engaging and way more interesting to follow. There are aspects of her character that are somewhat different from the book, but mostly, the show puts a much bigger emphasis on Beth's addiction problem and even ramps up her psychological downfall in a much more brutal way. A couple of characters in the show don't exist in the book, and there are also some romantic threads added to the show that are not in the source material. Globally speaking, it's not the largest difference in the world, a lot of the show is very faithful to the novel, but overall, I think the adaptation just elevates everything a couple notches to make the whole thing extra clean and more interesting. Also, the aesthetics of the show are fire. Number 7. Gossip Girl. So if you're familiar with my channel, you know that Gossip Girl was my shit when I was a teenager. I made a whole video about it a while back, you're welcome to go watch that if you haven't, but if you weren't a teenager between 2007 and like 2011, you just cannot understand the cosmic chokehold this show had on people when it was airing. To this day, most teen dramas are still trying to emulate the codes of Gossip Girl to build their stories. Like this 
this show completely reinvented a genre. And while it got kind of bad over time, I will die on the hill that the first season of Gossip Girl is a fucking stellar season of television with surprisingly intelligent writing and fascinating characters. It might be the single greatest season of TV ever put out by the CW. I would place it above like season 2 of Arrow or season 3 of The Vampire Diaries or even season 5 of Supernatural and I think it is neck and neck with the third season of the originals. Anyways, you get the gist. Gossip Girl was a hit unlike any anything we had seen before and it completely deserves its status of TV icon. Which is a little funny because if you've ever read the Gossip Girl novels, you immediately realize that this show had no fucking business being as good as it was. So yes, in case you don't know, Gossip Girl is adapted from a series of novels written by Cecily von Zigazar. The main line contains 12 books that came out between 2002 and 2009, although I think it's an open secret that the last handful of books in the series were written by ghostwriters. And I'm just gonna be very blunt here. The Gossip Girl novels are not good. Like, at all. I read a bunch of the books in the series years ago and it was just lame. There are some good ideas in there, most of them are adapted in the show, but I was also really surprised by them because I didn't realize how different the books were from the show. And I immediately understood why there was never the same level of pop culture discourse around the books. The Gossip Girl show reinvents the story in such a smart way where it makes it insanely better and quite different while also not being the most inaccurate adaptation. As the show goes, it veers further and further further away from the books, but the first couple of seasons are full of elements from the source material and they're all used in the advantage of a much, much superior take on the characters. There are just so many ways the show improved the story of the books, from characters to plot lines, and that is true from episode 1. The big mystery of Gossip Girl at the start of the story is why did Serena Vanderwoodson leave New York for a year so abruptly? In the TV show, the big twist of season 1 is that Serena was fine with everyone believing that she left out of shame after she hooked up with Nate, aka her best friend Blair's boyfriend, but the reality, and one of the coolest reveals in the show, is that she left New York so abruptly because she thought she killed someone. However, in the books, this whole dimension is not there. In the books, Serena left because she hooked up with Nate. It's literally the only reason. In fact, the love triangle between Blair, Nate, and Serena that has such a small place in the show, like the show moves on from it very quickly, is kind of the main storyline of the books. It goes on for a while, and it is way more intense than what we see in the show. And yes, that also means that the iconic, messy, and mutually abusive Blair and Chuck relationship that, let's be frank, carried most of the show doesn't exist in the books. In the books, Nate remains Blair's main love interest the whole time. Chuck Bass is barely a character in the books. He is not nearly as important to this story as he is in the show. Although he does have a pet monkey in the novels. The show puts a major emphasis emphasis on Serena's relationship with Dan Humphrey, which is fantastic in season 1, but that doesn't really happen in the books either. Dan sort of has a crush on her, and eventually they date super briefly and break up almost immediately when they realize they have literally nothing in common, and that's it. In the books, Serena has an older brother named Eric, but in the show, Eric is now her younger brother, who becomes a more fragile person Serena wants to take care of. We find out that she she returned to New York after a year away because Eric tried to commit suicide and she wants to be there for him. It adds an element of motivations for her character that is very much needed in that story. Because in the books, Serena returns to New York because she was kicked out of her other school for excessive partying and skipping classes. Also, Eric is gay in the show, which is something that is just not in the books. Eric in the books is like a womanizer and if I remember correctly, I think he ends up having a relationship with Blair. Oh, and speaking of siblings, Blair also has a little brother in the books named Tyler that does not exist in the show. Which I think was a fantastic idea because when it comes to her family dynamics, the show focuses
focuses way more on Blair's individual relationships with her mom and her father. Lily and Rufus, respectively Serena's mom and Dan's dad, a fan favorite couple in the show that created so much drama with their kids, are not a thing in the books. I mean, their characters exist, but they don't really know each other. Their romance never happens in the source material. They definitely were not high school sweethearts, and they sure as hell did not have a secret baby together 20 years ago. This entire thing is unique to the show. I would say that the only thing the books did better than the show is the simple fact that the books never reveal the identity of Gossip Girl. Gossip Girl is more of a godlike entity that watches over the events of the story, and that's never compromised at any point, which is something the show should have stuck with. Anyway, yeah, the Gossip Girl show is just vastly superior to the books. Season 1 alone wipes out the 7 books I read, and I think there's a reason why the show remains an absolute staple of pop culture where the books have mostly been forgotten over the years. They're just not that memorable. Okay, let's move on. Number 6. Avengers Infinity War. This one is a little special, but I don't think I can make this video without mentioning it. So yeah, we're gonna dive into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Now, the thing with the MCU is that it's extremely rare that an entry in the franchise actually turns out to be a faithful adaptation of any comic book that it theoretically adapts. Personally, I always found this was one of the strengths of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, its ability to take ideas from legendary comic books and completely reinvent them to fit the continuity of the movies. Like, Captain America Civil War is not at all a faithful adaptation of the Civil War comics. Like, it's completely different. It's taking the concept of the Civil War comics, but remixing it as a direct sequel to Avengers 1 and 2. And it's pretty much like that for every movie in the MCU. Age of Ultron has pretty much nothing to do with the Age of Ultron comic. Spider-Man No Way Home is not really adapted from any comic, like, you get the idea. I think the MCU project that has tried to follow an actual comic book storyline the closest to date is probably Eternals which pretty much follows the plot of Neil Gaiman's 2007 run with a few changes. Obviously, Eternals is not that great, like many Marvel projects that came out in the last few years now. I've already made a video about that movie, go watch that if you haven't. So I think it's safe to say the idea of the MCU outdoing the comics is not necessarily true. Except for Avengers Infinity War. Infinity War is quite interesting to me because this movie was not actually inspired by the Infinity War comic book. They share a title, but the Infinity War movie is actually based on another comic book called The Infinity Gauntlet, a six-issue event series that came out in 1991. Like, this is the comic book that has the iconic moment where Thanos does the infamous snap that kills half of the universe. But the movie takes a very different approach approach to that story. For one, Avengers Infinity War kind of flips the narrative of the comic by changing its story progression. The movie follows Thanos, who is kind of the main character of that story, as he comes to finish his lifelong quest of collecting the Infinity Stones, the six celestial gems of power at the origin of the universe. In the comic book though, we don't really get any of it. The Infinity Gauntlet begins with Thanos being pretty much done with his quest, which leads to one of the biggest differences between the comic and the adaptation. The Infinity War movie ends with Thanos collecting the final stone in Wakanda and committing the infamous snap that wipes out half of life in the universe. Everything in the movie leads to that moment. In the comics though, Thanos does the snap at the very start, like in the first issue. The story begins with him wiping half of the universe. That's the event that sets everything in motion, not the opposite. Even the Avengers, I think, arrive after the snap. The comic book is also populated with characters that never appeared in the MCU or were only introduced after the movie. Adam Warlock is one of the main characters in the comic, along with the Silver Surfer and Mephisto, with appearances from Galactus and Doctor Doom. The Black Order does 
does not appear in the comics. They were actually introduced much later in a completely different storyline. And the roster of heroes in the comics is quite different from the movie. While, yes, the comic features the likes of Iron Man, Doctor Strange, Captain America, Scarlet Witch, or Spider-Man, it also has a completely different lineup at the forefront, including Wolverine, She-Hulk, Namor, Cyclops, and Nova. It's also notable that the Guardians of the Galaxy are not a part of the Infinity Gauntlet comics, at the exception of Gamora, who actually dies very early on and has a much smaller role to play in the story. Now, the Infinity Gauntlet comic series is nothing short of iconic. It is really, really good. It was a very influential comic for a number of reasons, and there are so many aspects of it that I really enjoy. But overall, I, I kind of think Avengers Infinity War is the better story. Not only does it feel less bloated by its nature of having less characters, I also think this adaptation raises the stakes by making Thanos way more threatening and most of all by giving him motivations that hold more weight. You've probably heard about this, but in the comics, Thanos' reason for wiping half of the universe is very very different from his reasons in the movie. In Infinity War, Thanos wants to wipe out half of the universe's population at random so that the universe can be balanced. He feels that overpopulation is becoming an excessive problem, causing the universe resources to be too thin, and he believes that if it is left unchecked, life will cease to exist. But if he wipes out half of life, the amount of resources will be huge and everyone can live in better conditions. Little one, it's a simple calculus. This universe is finite, its resources is finite. If life is left unchecked, life will cease to exist. It needs correction. You don't know that! That's why he wants the Infinity Stones. He's an insane god who is convinced he is saving the universe by killing half of it. However, Thanos in the comic books has completely different motivations. In the comics, he wants to erase half of the universe's population because he's horny. Okay, that's an oversimplification, but it's also kind of true, sort of? In the Infinity Gauntlet, Thanos wipes half of the universe because he wants to impress a woman, more specifically, death, like the physical incarnation of death. He's been in love with death since he was very young, and he thinks the best way to win her heart is to give her half of the universe. So he goes on a quest to collect the Infinity Stone so he can hopefully get her to like him back. It's basically the biggest notice me senpai move of all time. It's not even really his idea because Mistress Death brings him back to life and asks him to do it for her because she sensed a sort of cosmic imbalance and she wants it fixed. It's a completely different set of circumstances and I believe the movie actually makes Thanos a way more interesting character than he is in the comics. The movie also puts a very strong emphasis on Thanos' relationship with Gamora, his adopted daughter. Like I said, in the comics, Gamora dies almost immediately because she's wiped out in the snap. But in the movie, Gamora plays a much larger role and her bizarre love-hate relationship with Thanos is much more at the forefront of the story. There's this heartbreaking scene where Gamora thinks she killed Thanos, which has been her number one goal since we met her in Guardians of the Galaxy. But as soon as she kills him, it's not a huge triumphant, heroic moment. She actually just breaks down in tears. Gamora has been so convinced and driven by her hatred for Thanos, yet she ends up realizing that watching him die hurts. She realizes in the most painful way imaginable that there is a part of her that still cares for him. And that moment is then mirrored by Thanos having to kill Gamora to get one of the Infinity Stones, and he cries as he does because Gamora is the only person he's ever truly loved. None of these moments exist in the comics, despite the amount of heart they bring to the story. Same goes for the state of the Avengers when they face Thanos. In the comics, they just kind of show up because it's a cool 
crossover event, so everybody's there and everybody's happy. However, Avengers Infinity War takes place after the events of Captain America Civil War, and the Avengers are now separated in two groups that have not been in contact with each other for like two years. The Avengers being divided becomes a huge problem for how things go against Thanos, and it leads to some very interesting character moments that eventually carry on into Endgame. Lots of changes, lots of differences, and it's also true with a number of crazy moments. The legendary one-on-one -on -one fight between Thanos and Iron Man does not exist in the comics, nor does the Battle of Wakanda, which means yes, the iconic Bring Me Thanos scene is unique to the movie, as well as the fucking classic that is the scene where the Avengers meet the Guardians for the first time. I'm gonna ask you this one time. Where is Gamora? Yeah, I'll do you one better. Who's Gamora? I'll do you one better. Why is Gamora? It's just so many great moments, and I think overall, Infinity War is just too good. It takes all of the core concepts from the Infinity Gauntlet and improves them drastically in what is essentially a completely new story. It has more iconic moments, the characters have much stronger motivations, there is way more of an emotional core to the story, and it's really just a fantastic example of an adaptation that does better than the source material. Also, yes, Infinity War is my favorite MCU movie. Number 5. The Hunger Games. Okay, so here's my big unpopular opinion of the month. I don't think the Hunger Games books are that good. To be completely honest, I was never really a fan of them. They're not necessarily bad, like this isn't divergent, but they're also not all that great if you ask me. However, the movies? God damn. Now, I'm obviously not talking about Mocking J parts 1 and 2. While I think I like part 1 more than most people, I still have to recognize that these two movies are not on par with the first two. Mocking J part 2 is particularly bad. And generally speaking, I think splitting Mocking J in two parts was a terrible idea to begin with. It's like Harry Potter split its finale in two and suddenly every YA adaptation thought they had to do the same thing. And I think Hunger Games was the perfect example of why it should have never been a trend. Even the director of these movies has admitted that splitting Mockingjay in two parts was an undeniable mistake. And he said he would never do something like that again. But as far as the first two movies go, yeah, I would say it shouldn't even be a conversation that they're better than the books. Everybody was taken off guard by the first movie. Whether you had read the book or not, everyone was surprised by how good it was and it became instantly iconic. But the big one, of course, course is catching fire. This is where it's at, my boy? Oh my god, I've never really talked about the Hunger Games on this channel, so I've never expressed how much I love catching fire. This movie goes so hard for no reason. Like, bro, who asked you? Who gave you the right, my guy? And for the record, at the risk of repeating myself, the book is not nearly as good as this movie. This adaptation really unlocked the potential of the entire IP. It makes no sense how good it is. Bro, the aesthetics, the performances, the darkness, the tension when the game starts, the raising of the stakes, the ending, bruh. Catching fire fucking slaps. I watch it every couple of years and I'm still surprised at how good it is. It's easily one of the best YA adaptations of all time, which is saying something because the book is far from being the best YA book of all time. I think it's pretty average. The movie does make some big and small changes that distance it from the book, mainly by getting rid of certain characters like Darius, Bonnie, and Twill, or just skipping some bigger moments from the book to tighten the story and pick up the pacing. But overall, it's nothing too crazy, but the movie just elevates the story to a degree that's like literally insane. I will never be able to accurately represent just how disrespectful of a slam dunk Catching Fire was. This movie had no fucking right to be as dope as it was. It's very unfortunate that the next two sequels could not live up to that standard. I haven't seen the new movie that just came out, the 
the one with the very complicated title. But from what I've heard, the movie is pretty good, so it probably deserves its place here too, because from what I understand, this movie is adapted from a book that was received quite poorly by fans. Like, it's not a great book. And if I'm not mistaken, it was directed by the same guy who did the last three Hunger Games movies, so I'm very curious to see how it turned out. Maybe I should make a video about the Hunger Games. Anyways, let's move on. Number four. Blade Runner. Blade Runner, aka Ridley Scott's ultimate masterpiece, is adapted from a 1968 novel by Philip K. Dick titled Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Both the book and the movie tell the story of a man named Rick Deckard who hunts down and kills androids. However, they could not be more different. Ridley Scott took a number of creative liberties with the book, essentially rendering the adaptation a unique entity that is far removed from the source material. That said though, all of those creative changes are massive improvements. For one, the portrayal of the protagonist Rick Deckard in the movie is very different from his book counterpart. Deckard in the book is kind of a joke. He's described as ugly, he's a punchline at work, he's actually married in the book, Book to a wife named Iran who is depressed as hell, and Deckard in the book is obsessed with the idea of obtaining a live animal he and his wife could take care of. They have an electric sheep, but they would like to quote unquote upgrade to a real one. Deckard in the movie though is very, very different. Movie Deckard does not have a wife. He's divorced, he's a very lonely man, and he also is much more respected in his field because unlike his book counterpart, he's actually the best at what he does. His skill is basically unmatched and actually, at the beginning of the movie, he's retired. In the movie, Deckard is a Blade Runner, a man who hunts down replicants, but in the book, the term Blade Runner does not exist. These guys are simply referred to as bounty hunters. The book has androids or Andes, but in the movie, that term is never used. Instead, artificial human beings are exclusively referred to as replicants. The movie also decreases the scale of the story to make it more intimate and to dive way more into the main theme around the meaning of being human. That theme is very present in the book, but in different ways. In the book, Deckard is hunting down rogue androids who escaped from Mars and traveled to Earth in an attempt to escape slavery from humans, whereas in the adaptation, he's going after a gang of replicants who are trying to find a way to extend their lives. An entire storyline that is basically non-existent in the novel. And that's because in the novel, androids have a maximum lifetime of about four years. And it's explained that the reason for that is because their cells are unable to regenerate and cannot be replaced when they deteriorate over time. In the movie though, replicants also have a lifetime of four years, but the big difference that completely changes the the story is that replicants have a four-year lifespan by design. It's essentially a safety measure from their creators to make sure replicants can't evolve too much, which is the only real way to have tangible control over them. This leads a group of rogue replicants to seek their creator in a desperate attempt to extend their lives, and Deckard is brought out of retirement to go after them. This one detail leads the book and the movie to have completely different stories dealing with the same characters in completely different circumstances. The book also deals quite a lot with a form of futuristic religion known as mercerism. It's a big part of the book, but it's never mentioned in the movie. They completely left that out. And it's a significant change, but one that allows for the movie to focus more on the meaning of humanity, especially when it comes to Roy, the leader of the replicants, who has a much larger and active role in the movie, unlike his book counterpart who stays in one place the entire time. It leads to one of the greatest monologues in cinema history with the tears in rain scene, a moment that still gives me chills every time I see it. All those moments will be lost in time, like tears in rain. Also, when it comes to timeline and setting, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep came out in 1968, 
and the book takes place in San Francisco in the far distant future of 1992, whereas the movie was released in 1982 and takes place in Los Angeles in the year 2019. Ridley Scott drastically reinvented the atmosphere of the book to create this beautiful yet haunting cyberpunk setting that gave the movie an iconic aesthetic that revolutionized science fiction. Oh, and I should probably add, there is a sequel novel to Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? It's called Blade Runner The Edge of Human. It's a weird mix that acts as a sequel to the book but also a sequel to the movie and it's not very good. It was supposed to be adapted as a movie called Blade Runner Down in the late 90s, but that project died, and eventually, in 2017, we got the official sequel to Blade Runner, Blade Runner 2049, which, by the way, is one of my favorite movies of all time. However, aside from vaguely taking inspiration from a plot point in another random book sequel, 2049 is not an adaptation of any Blade Runner novel. It's an original story. But as far as Blade Runner goes, yeah, there is no contest here. The movie outdid the book spectacularly. It's very hard to deny that. I mean, hell, even the author of the original novel has admitted that Blade Runner is better than his book on pretty much every level. And he referred to the movie as the completion of his life's work. That honestly has to be the highest praise any adaptation could possibly get, so... I rest my case. Number three, Arcane. Okay, this one is gonna be quick because it's honestly not that serious, but I had to mention it. Yes, I know Arcane is not technically an adaptation of League of Legends, it's a prequel to the events of the game, but the show does make significant changes to the lore, so much so that we can pretty much consider that Arcane has its own canon. Which, all things considered, makes sense, especially because the lore of League of Legends has been growing a reputation of being great, but a little too convoluted, inconsistent, and plagued with the tendency to contradict itself. But Arcane takes the best of it and remixes it to create a cohesive version of the story that improves on the original lore. And that's without mentioning the masterful art style of the show, which gives it a dreamy, unique identity. The story of Vi and Jinx is completely original to the show and kind of changes or recontextualizes everything about them in the game, the show makes Jinx and Vi sisters, and it changes key moments of their past to make their characters stronger, mainly by linking both of them to Silco a villain that is original to the show. The way Vi loses her crew plays out completely differently in the show than what we knew from the game, going from a heist gone wrong to a failed rescue mission. Jinx gets a completely original backstory that not only explains her mental instability, but also gives some much needed insight into her obsession with Vi. On top of that, the lore of the game is sort of modified to fit new character arcs, mainly with the show choosing to have Hextech discovered much later in the timeline and by completely different characters. Victor has an essentially rebooted story that is very far removed from what we knew him to be in the game, and Jace in the show is a very, very different incarnation of the character. But overall, with the way Arcane makes the plot tighter and adds a much needed heart to its story by intelligently reinventing characters all while staying faithful to their game counterpart, I do think the adaptation story is better. Both have fantastic lore, don't get me wrong, and a lot of Arcane is very faithful to the source material, but the changes made to the characters and their backstories are just too well executed, and it makes Arcane the superior incarnation. And I mean, they have to be doing something right, because as of October of 2023, Riot Games, the studio behind League of Legends, has announced that Arcane is now officially canon and it will serve as a new basis to tighten the lore of the game and make it one coherent entity. So yeah, when the adaptation is so good that it becomes the official canon of the source material, you know they were probably up to something. And if you haven't seen Arcane, please do yourself a favor, watch it. Number two, 
the boys. All right, I alluded to it in my last video about Gen V, but yes. I think it would be impossible to talk about adaptation surpassing the source material without talking about the boys. And I know a lot of the people who watch the show have never read the comics and don't really know what goes on in them, so I'll try to explain a little bit. First, you should probably know that the boys is not a faithful adaptation of the comics. In fact, as the show goes, it distances itself from the original story more and more, to the point where now, the series is pretty much its own original story. And once again, I'm gonna be super fucking blunt here, the boys, comics, fucking suck. They are bad. Really, really bad. It's honestly kind of a miracle that the show turned out to be what it is. You can kind of tell the people behind this show took the comic and saw its potential, so they adapted it knowing a lot would need to be changed to unlock that potential. The show makes changes that are very much a conscious choice to get rid of the stupidest aspects of the comics. But let me give you a bit of background. The boys comics were created by Garth Ennis, a man who fucking despises superheroes and thinks they're lame and for nerds and for a very long time, he kind of developed this obsession of telling stories where superheroes get brutally beat up and murdered. In 1995, he joined Marvel Comics and wrote a story titled Punisher Kills the Marvel Universe, in which the Punisher goes after every hero and villain in Marvel Comics and murders them one by one before killing himself. That kind of gives you an idea of what we're dealing with here. And about 10 years later, he created what was essentially the extension of that concept. Garth hated superheroes so much that he came up with a story about a group of vigilantes that have for only activity to hunt down superheroes and kill them as brutally as possible. He wanted to create a world where superheroes are actually all demented and corrupt maniacs with godlike powers who only live for money, sex, power, and violence, all to justify his desire to have them get beat up at every turn. And so, he created The Boys. The Boys ran for a total of 72 issues from 2006 to 2012, and like I said, these comics are fucking bullshit. Aside from being a weird fantasy for like depraved storytelling featuring a very large cast of one-dimensional characters and a story that almost exclusively banks on shock value to be interesting, it's also a very surface level idea for edgelords who think they're too cool for superheroes. So when Eric Kripke and Seth Rogen teamed up to adapt the comics as a TV series, they had to do a lot of work to add some much needed depth to the story and the characters. And that that's the biggest difference between the show and the comics that makes the show instantly superior, and that is simply the depth of it. In the comics, the characters are all one-dimensional, especially the superheroes. There is absolutely nothing to them, they're just evil, vile, cruel perverts with no layers, irredeemable caricatures of villains that are only here to be killed by the boys. And the boys themselves are just as one note. If you thought Billy Butcher was a messed up, morally gray character in the show, you have no idea what this guy does in the comics. From killing babies, enslaving people, pressuring Huey to become a murderer, to killing MM's ex-wife and eventually murdering the boys themselves, Butcher's comic book counterpart is a truly unhinged psychopath. He's an animal. He is just as bad, if not worse, than Homelander and Vault. The show's version of the character, however, is largely toned down. Though he is still very much crooked and capable of horrible things, this Butcher is way more human. He's given more layers, and Carl Urban manages to portray him with a more sympathetic personality, while also being faithful to how despicable he can be as a person. There's way more of a balance to his character, a balance that does not exist in the comics. Another big change is the character of Black Noir, who has a completely different role and a completely different backstory from the comic. In the comics, Black Noir's identity remains a mystery until the very end, when he's revealed to actually be a secret clone of Homelander who has been pulling the strings in the shadows and manipulating Homelander from the very start. I know that just sounded really stupid, 
and that's because it is. This is by far one of the dumbest twists ever, and I'm very glad the show got rid of it. Not only because it makes Black Noir a much better character in the adaptation, but also because it makes Homelander 100% responsible of his own actions. In the show, Black Noir turns out to be a completely new character named Irving, who was severely deformed after an incident with Soldier Boy. His story is really sad, and you feel for him way more when you have the context behind why he spends the whole show as a faceless, silent character. The show also decides to give a much bigger role to Queen Maeve, making her one of the most morally interesting characters in the entire story. In the comics, she's more of a background character who ends up dying very quickly when she refuses to remain loyal to Homelander. He just kills her immediately, and that's that. But in the show, while there is a confrontation between Maeve and Homelander as she decides to no longer stand by him, Homelander doesn't kill her on the spot. Even though she repeatedly attacks him, he actually tries to get her to stop at first because he doesn't want to fight her. He doesn't want to hurt her because he does care about her in his own fucked up way. It's another change that kind of gives the characters more layers and more agency. The characters in the show actually have motivations, something that is very rare in the comics. And those motivations shape their arcs and make this whole undercover war feel like it actually has high stakes on all sides. There are also a number of characters that have been completely transformed or flat out reinvented to make them better than they were in the comics. Most notable are the characters of Stormfront, the Nazi hero, and Victoria Newman, who are both men in the comics. But not only were their characters gender swapped, their story were significantly improved. Victoria Newman is a much more interesting and dangerous character than her comic book counterpart Victor, who was pretty much just a joke. He's a patsy, a mostly idiotic puppet of Vought that doesn't really have any interesting traits. In the show though, she is turned into an intricately complex character with very specific motivations. She's a politician who hides her powers from the world and she has a very different relationship with Vought. Kimiko is also given a new backstory that makes her character more tragic, and the show actually gives her a name. Yes, in the comic books, Kimiko doesn't have a name, and she's only referred to as the female. And now, she's more than a mindless assassin with super strength. She's a young woman who had her life ripped away from her and lost her family in the process, becoming something that she doesn't really like being. She's desperate to make choices for herself, to live a life she chooses to live rather than constantly being a victim of her circumstances. And of course, you have Homelander. While the idea of Homelander is sort of the same in the source material and the adaptation, the show makes him a way more threatening entity with an insanely unpredictable temper. This version of the character is more intelligent, more prone to manipulate others to have things his way, contrary to his comic book incarnation who is way more of a spoiled brat with the powers of a god who throws temper tantrums like a child. He's not nearly as smart or forthcoming, and he tends to just be an impulsive piece of shit. Now, yes, the show's version of Homelander is also very impulsive, which causes him a lot of issues, but he's way more cunning, and as time goes, he learns to get himself to the top by carefully manipulating the people around him, even getting powerful politicians under his control. And while comic book Homelander is morally even worse than the show's, like seriously, he commits some unspeakable acts in the source material, the show's version is still a quite horrible man, but there's also a vulnerability to him that does not exist in the comics. Homelander in the comics is very one-dimensional, and we come to find out that a lot of the more heinous crimes he committed were actually not committed by him, but by his clone which is absolute bullshit. But the show strikes the perfect balance. It does a great job at portraying the whiny, petulant, and insecure man-child from the comics, while also adding an element of fear with his character that makes him truly terrifying. Anthony Starr is just too good as this character, and he makes him way more menacing than he ever was in the source material. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, every time Homelander is in a scene, I feel anxious. Because you truly 
truly do not know if the people in the scene will be alive by the time it ends. He can snap at any time and the show is great at keeping you on your toes when it comes to his reactions and his temper. But I think the single greatest change that really makes the story of the show superior to the comics is the superpower imbalance. So if you don't know, in the universe of the boys, people acquire superpowers with a substance known as Compound V. In the comics, Compound V is literally everywhere. It's all over the place. People become soups all the time, you can accidentally eat Compound V, if soups have kids, they'll have superpowers, like it's rampant, it's everywhere and easily accessible. In the show, however, Compound V is very carefully controlled by Vought and is not easily accessible. Moreover, it's implied in the show that people that have been exposed to Compound V, so soups, cannot naturally reproduce, which is why Vought hid Homelander's son from him and from the world because he's theoretically the very first child to be naturally born with superpowers. And one of my favorite changes from the comic is that in the show, the boys don't have superpowers all the time. Season 3 introduces Temp V, the pill that gives you superpowers for 24 hours, which is used to a limited degree, especially when we find out that repeated use kills the consumer. But in the comics, the boys boys are always on compound V. They have superpowers all the time, which completely takes away the stakes and the massive gap of power between the boys and the soups that make their endeavor so complicated. Like in the comics, they can just barge into a room full of soups and beat the shit out of them and kill them like it's nothing. In the show though, they have to rely on their wit to outsmart the soups in order to kill them, and most of the time, they fail. It adds a real dimension of stress that makes the story way more compelling. I mean hell, by the end of season 3, the boys have successfully managed to kill only 3 soups. The whole show! Look, I could do this all day. <laughs> when I tell you every aspect of the comic book was improved greatly in the TV show, it is not a joke. There are more characters that are completely reinvented, like A-Train, Madeline Stilwell, The Deep, etc, etc. Like, it's a whole thing. And I think The Boy stands out with Gossip Girl because most of the stories I've covered here are stories that are already pretty good in the source material but made better in the adaptation. The Boys, however, is the greatest example of taking genuinely terrible source material and turning it into something far greater than anyone would have imagined. This show is the proof that sometimes the right idea lands on the wrong person. Whew. All right, this one was long, but it's time to end it. So let's move on to number one. Drive. This is it. The number one example. The adaptation that made me obsessed with this topic in the first place. Drive, another one of my favorite movies of all time. Now, very few people are actually aware of the fact that Drive is a book adaptation. This movie was inspired by a book of the same name that came out in 2005, both telling the story of an unnamed stunt driver who drives cars on movie sets during the day and drives for criminal activities at night. However, the movie makes some small but significant changes to the story that add a lot of tension. The movie essentially merges two different storylines into one, which leads to a completely different outcome. The most surprising of it is that in the movie, Irene runs away from Driver when she sees his true nature, which happens in the masterpiece of tension and emotion that is the elevator scene. It's the last time Driver sees Irene and he then goes on to risk his life to make sure she and her son are not harmed. Now, in the book, this plays out sort of similarly. Irene's baby daddy is killed in a failed robbery and Driver is determined to make good on his promise to look after her and her son. Except, in the book, Driver fails. Because Irene is later killed by a bullet in the head during a drive-by gone wrong. This whole plotline is also completely disconnected from Bernie and Nino, the two villains from the movie. They do exist in the book, but they arrive at a completely different time. They have nothing to do with Irene. Their bit of the story is also completely different from the adaptation. The whole subplot with Shannon and the race car? Yeah, no, that, that's not in the book. This was completely original to the movie. The characters are also 
changed to some degree. Ryan Gosling's driver is very similar to his book counterpart, but they made him a bit darker. He barely speaks the whole movie, and the way he snaps at a few moments is kind of removed from the source material. Driver in the novel is also a man of few words, but he's also more chill. He's worried about making connections because everyone he gets close to dies. But both in the movie and in the book, Driver is a complete enigma. The whole thing that makes this character so gripping is that the story refuses to let you in on who he is. It keeps denying you information, and so you get to see facets of his personality in the most interesting ways. But the movie has the ability to pull it off with more subtle moments that don't require words, which makes his character even more fascinating. Irene is a character that was changed a bit more drastically, and I think this is maybe the one part where the movie kind of fucked up. First of all, the very unfortunate change is that in the book, Irene is called Irina and she's Mexican. The movie, however, completely ignores that she's Latina and goes for a good old white American. And don't get me wrong, I love Carrie Mulligan and she is unbelievably good in this role. But like, come on guys. That's a dumb change. She's also not married to Standard anymore in the books. She's way more aware that he's a fuck up and she has some agency. She doesn't need to be taken care of as much as the movie version of the character. Like Irina's more of a badass. Because her movie counterpart Irene is someone with less agency that feels stuck. She got into a bad situation because of her dumbass husband that she never left and she has no idea how to get out of it alive. She's frozen, lost, and desperate to protect her son in a world where she has no power. Like, she's an interesting character, don't get me wrong. I love Irene in the movie, but I think Irina was a better character. The book also has two very important characters named Manny and Doc that don't exist in the movie. Instead, they're merged into one character with Shannon, who is played by Brian Cranston in the adaptation. He does exist in the books, but he's not the same character like at all. He doesn't have a garage, he doesn't have like race cars and like none of that. In the book, he's a driver past his glory days who made some bad choices. That's about it. So yeah, the movie makes him much better very easily. He's a great emotional core for driver and one of the only friends he has which makes the end of his story even more tragic. The timeline of the story is also modified, and I think the movie makes it way more coherent and thrilling while keeping its themes intact. Drive has a notoriously very heavy tone, it's like a neo-noir type thing, but the movie adds to that tone with an incredible soundtrack that fits the atmosphere of this sinister side of Los Angeles. But where the book is very much a brutal revenge story, the movie is kind of reframed as a tragic love story story cursed by crime and desperation. It flips the story in a way that brings more emotion to the table, but in a subtle way, and I think it makes it so much better than the book. Oh, and also, the book has a sequel. It's called Driven, and I hope they never adapt it. The ending of the Drive movie adaptation is perfect. If you do the sequel, you ruin it. Ah, so there you have it, folks. Nine adaptations that surpassed the source material. Are there any other that came to you that I didn't mention? I'm sure there are some I haven't considered, so feel free to shout them out in the comments down below. I'd be super happy to check them out. I personally think it's such a fascinating topic. I've been wanting to make a video on it for like months now, and I'm glad I finally got around to talking about it on the channel. So thanks for watching, and see you next time. You got me feeling mad. Keep it low